I'm Mitch. And I'm Jeff. And we're blowing it up on Capital Chaos TV. How the comments make me feel on the PRP and Blabbermouth makes me laugh. Uh, they're pretty funny, actually. Uh, I don't really care. Like, they can say anything they want, but it's pretty funny. Uh, heard some good ones. A lot of people don't know what they're talking about, which is pretty funny, but there's some pretty comedic people on there. I, I can't wait for their Netflix, spe- uh, Netflix specials. It should be pretty good. <laughs> I usually try tracking them down. You know? <laughs> he goes and kills him. I got a good uh, internet skill. He's on, the, he's on the dark web. And I know who you are. He can find you. Motherfucker. <laughs> you. Who turned me on to music was, uh, well, you know, of course, my mom had the records of the house and eight tracks, and I threw on Michael Jackson's Off the Wall, and I was like, I was blown away. I was like, oh, this this is awesome, you know, just the rhythm of it, the ambience of it, and, you know, greatest singer of all time, maybe. So Off the Wall, I was hooked, and after that, I started kind of getting more into music, and Celebration by Cool Ning Gang was my favorite song when I was younger. And then uh, I went to my cousin's house. I have three boy cousins. And uh, I went to their house and they were shooting pool and they were blasting Too Fast for Love on the stereo. And I was like, who is this? And uh, you know, I didn't say it at first, I was singing that. And then when I heard the cowbell on Come, and come On Dance, dong, 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 I'm like, all right, I gotta ask who this is now. So they said, Smotley Crew. And I was like, I'm hooked. And then after that, like that opened a whole door for like, you know, Scorpions, Rat, Ozzy, and then that led to Slayer and Suicidal Tendencies and then it just snowballed from there and here I am in a polka band. Me? I guess like the first thing I saw of like music was uh, I used to go to thrift stores with my mom and there was a, a big drum set set up and I wasn't allowed to play it at the store but I was allowed to sit behind it and I would just sit back there and just be like fuck man I want this is what I want to do I want to play these things and so then you know a million years later here I am and uh, yeah I mean I got into like punk rock early on stuff like that I remember I used to listen to like surf music like <laughs> weird stuff like that um, until I found out what punk rock was and then my cousin called me up one night and uh, I just like put a tape on. We just listened to like GBH, this the cassette tape recorded, re-recorded a million times, <laughs> crappy sound quality over the phone. And I was just like, damn, that's that's my shit right there. We just found it and just explored stuff from there, you know. And that's pretty much how we got into it. Me and him playing music together and stuff. So uh, I started, yeah, I started playing music. Uh, my dad, I, for some, it was just like him. I, for some reason, I wanted to play drums. Um, my dad actually, my dad played guitar. He was in a band and he played guitar, and so I figured if I play drums, me and him could sort of band together. And I was like 10 years old, so I begged my dad every year for for drums for Christmas. And then my when I was 12 for Christmas, I got my first drum set, and then I played those things till they caught fire. You know, like I played every single day. I was playing the Slayer, Motley Crue, like Rush, anything I could find, like to fun play, fun uh, have fun playing to and. I played drums my life, and I played in a couple bands, and then um, uh, I was in a band called Sock that had, I played drums, Grady Sang, and Sean Lopez from Far played guitar, and then we broke up, and so we tried to get, we tried to replace Sean with another guitar player, and it didn't work out, everybody sucked, so I was like, screw it, I'm going to sell my drum set and buy a guitar, so I sold my drum set, bought a guitar, and started Will Haven, and that's kind of where I am now, and I think I started... Will Haven when I was 22, and now I am 40, going on 45. So been been this band for eons, dude. Yep. What makes a good Will Haven song? I think, I mean, everybody has their opinion what our best record is or our best songs, but to me, like, our new record basically encapsulates, like, kind of showcases everybody's strengths. Um, on our past records, you know, I think our, our drumming was kind of not showcase as much it was more we had the same time signature for every song you know so mitch was kind of limited to what he could do um and then when it had we have that formula kind of does limit a lot but our new record is so open so much stuff going on his drumming got to show a lot more um and you know that helped me my guitar playing and even our bass player our new bass player started picking up stuff really quick because it was so so much going on he could kind of add his own stuff to it and then grady just absolutely killed it so I think what makes a great Will Haven song is when everybody can showcase their talent 
you know, because we're all great musicians. You know, he's probably the best musician of all of us. Um, but he's always been the one that's been kind of held back. So, like, now with the new record, he's been able to showcase his talent. And it's like, it's actually made, that's what made this record so great, is everybody kicked ass on it. So, to me, that's what makes a great really record song. Uh, influences you can hear in our music. Oh, man, it's... A lot of Bjork you can hear. Yeah. Music, I think. A lot of uh, David Cassidy. No, it's... Dude, we are all over the board. Like, for me, like, metal's not even my favorite music. You know, it just... I don't even know why I play heavy music. I think because I... It, it, for me, music is an emotion. And when we play live, like, I couldn't go up there and play some Sade stuff. Like, I couldn't do it. I, I need to go up there and just destroy people. I need to, like, kill them. So music for me is, like, that. I need that bulldozer to just go and just knock people down. So heavy music for me does that. So when I incorporate that with my other influences, which are, like, Pink Floyd and Radiohead and stuff like that, trying to mix the two together, that's what my influences are. Like, I need something heavy and, and crushing, but also need some soothing to relax that or give that stuff some space, you know? So it's a work in progress, but my influences like are all over the board. I like, I like metal, hip hop. I mean, I grew up on gangster rap, so like I'm not even like a rocker, you know, like I'm more of a gangster rap guy. So like I'm all over the board for me, you know? Um, so it's really hard for me to like say what my influences are because it's just in a blender. Everything's put in a blender and it just comes out, you know? Pretty much like what you're saying is like anything that make like moves you you know musically is what influences me like if something i, I can listen to something and like gives me the chills or makes the hair stand up right here that's what i like and when i'm playing with these guys and we have that like big wall of sound going on stage or even in our just our practice place by ourselves that makes my hair stand up you know like that and that's how we know how to do it so i mean to me that's like that's the ultimate kind of thing you know that does the same thing for me you know, if people call us a noise band, it actually makes sense because we're not a metal band. We're not trying to be metal. We're not trying to be anything. We're just trying to make noise. We're trying to make the biggest wall of noise you can possibly hear, and that's that's what we are. So, yeah, the the scene we were kind of at the very tail end of it. Like I, you know, I grew up with the Far and Deftones guys, so I was there when the height of the Cattle Club. You know, when they were they were headlining there, and both Far and Deftones were just selling it out. Um, and then Will Haven kind of sh shortly came after that. So we'll have, Will Haven headlined there maybe twice. Um, the, the last time, we were supposed to headline there, and then right before we saw the headline, that's when they had the fire, like a week before a show. So we got to do it twice while we were there, but we played there a bunch of times, opening up for bands Will Haven did. So we did catch the tail end of the height of the Cattle Club days. Um, but I grew up to the Cattle Club. Like before Will Haven, I used to go every weekend. I saw Funky Blue Velvet, you know, Deftones, Far, like all those bands, you know. So, and then, the, you know, the National Acts had come through too. I'd see them. So, uh, but yeah, Will Haven got the very tail end of it before it burnt down. Uh, but I, I miss that place. I do. It, it was my. It was the greatest time of my life, hanging out that spot and seeing those bands play. Uh, no, I have so many great memories there, and I, 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 I can't even. There were so many bands that just blew me away. I saw. I mean, I saw Helmet there, Quicksand. You know, I saw Corn, and no one was at the Corn show when they played there. You know, it's like these bands and Mr. Bungle. It's like it was insane. Like those bands that came through there, and you're just like standing there in front of them, and like no one. Half the band, no one even knew who they were. Like when I saw Quicksand, no one knew who they were. I knew them because, you know, we were on the. I knew the whole Revelation catalog, so I was like, oh, it's Quicksand, you know. But there was a lot of people that were there to see Helmet, you know. And now Quicksand's who they are now. So it's that place is just a, a little gold mine, you know. You just go there and see some. I saw Tool open up for Far there, you know. That's crazy. And they played a half hour set, and no one knew who they were, you know. And I bought a e I bought the opiate. They were selling the opiate EPs there. And I bought that, and I was like, I was like oh, they're pretty good. I like them. And I bought the CD, and now they're the fucking biggest band in the world. And it's like, but I opened up, it was Tool, Far, and Fallacy. And Tool just Tool just happened to be in town and played the show. I'm like, it's so crazy, like, the stuff that you saw there, you know? It's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I mean, Peg is like, uh, we were friends with Peg. I mean, almost before Will Haven, I knew Peg. And, like, you know, Will Haven's always been a band that's like, we... We have our core members, and then we add people in to like when we play live. Cause there's so much going on in Willavian's music. We always kind of sometimes need that help to kind of push it over the edge. So we've had a bunch of rotating guitar players come in and out of the band just to like help fill in live, and uh, usually just for tour though. Uh, we'd always just write ourselves, but we always take a guitarist with on tour. Um, but Pag's like one of the coolest guys in the world, you know, and so he just kind of just. We didn't want him to ever leave, you know, like we just loved him so much and wanted him to be a part of the band. Like we just said, well, 
this group playing live, just live, come to practice, come hang out, you know, because he's an awesome guy. So he's always been in our family, you know, and, and when he started writing this record, he he was doing horse neck, you know, and, and running this place. So he didn't have time to come jam with us. We understood that. We were cool with it. But it gave us more time for me and him to just focus each other on the record. So it worked out. But but I'm, I'm happy for PAG. I'm happy for this club. It's yeah, this awesome. this town needed this club. Dire, you know, dying. This dying scene needed this club, so hopefully, this can be the new cattle club for the, for the youth. Um, so yeah, I'm stoked for Pag for doing this, and I'm stoked that we can play and help them, you know, try to grow it. So uh, we named it Morte because we've always, uh, well, we had the envision that we wanted to call it Death because we thought this would be the last Willhaven record, and we thought, well, we might just call it Death. You know, the Death of Willhaven makes sense, um, but Willhaven, we can't be that blatant. You know, we try not to be so to the point. So we always try to use obscure words. And like we view, you know, El Diablo, our first record out for the devil, Carpe Diem, you know, and, you know, stuff we've always put. Vore Dyer. Vore Dyer, always put like different languages. <laughs> yeah, so we just figured, well, let's call it Morte because it's, it's death, but it's cool because it's a Spanish connotation. So it's it works. Yeah. It's just seemed like a common theme that we've always kind of done. Yeah. Like you said, you know, started it out with El Diablo. And it's kind of. But you can tell who doesn't know their Spanish and who does, because I've had interviews and they say it completely wrong. I'm like, all right. Muerte. Muerte. They're like, they're like Murte? <laughs> Mur, Mur, Murty? It's funny. This is. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I. This record, I love every song. Like, I, there's not one song that I'm like. You know, our past records, I'll come up on a song, I'll skip it. You know? But this record, I'll listen all the way through and. I love every song on it. Um, I think my favorite song on the record is, I would say, "Winds of Change," just because his drumming is so badass on it, and it's like I think it was his kind of like coming out, you know, stepping out of that Will Even box a little bit and just getting crazy with it. Um, and it just it's all over the place. And the ending is so epic, and it sounds killer live, and uh, it's just a fun song to play too. Like when we play it live at practice, it's fun to play. Um, and I always get excited to play that song. So for me, it's that one right now. But it's probably gonna change because all the songs are awesome. What's your favorite song? Favorite song? Um, I mean, it's hard to say, man. I don't know. I like uh, I like the sun. It's a good one. Um, kind of like we've always thought that was like kind of our a special kind of song that uh, out of the thing for a long time and well, the first one you wrote. yeah so I, I probably have to go with that one on the new album but like you said i mean they're all they're all cool to me i like them i've been listening that thing's been in my truck ever since we recorded it and i haven't taken it out yet i'll go back and forth to the radio and stuff when I, <laughs> but go back into it yeah like nothing on all right there it is again but yeah i like them all that Actually. We did. We actually, because uh, we did the song with Stefan Carpenter from Deftones, and we did that separately than the record. We went in and did that song, and so we had a bunch of studio time left, and so I was like, well, let's just cover a Pink Floyd song, you know, like, let's do something fun. So we recur uh, We did Pink Floyd, uh, we did the uh, Eclipse, uh, what's Brainwash. oh yeah, Brainwash Eclipse, oh, yeah, Last on Dark Side of the Moon. Two songs that run into each other. Yeah, so we covered that, and it sounds killer. We don't know when we're going to put it out or what we're going to do with it, but it sounds <laughs> it sounds pretty badass, yeah. And I'm stoked because like, Pink Floyd's my favorite. Yeah, Pink Floyd's my favorite band, so to cover a Pink Floyd song was a lot of fun for me. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it sounded really good. You know, it doesn't... I live my I live my in a bubble. Like, I, for me, being older... I don't even trip on that stuff anymore. Like I, it, you know, I've got to the point in life where I just like I don't care, you know. Like I, when I was in my twenties, like all, you know, because I was in, we were straight edge back in the day, and in that scene back then, it was pretty militant, and you were pretty passionate about not drinking, not doing drugs, and animal rights, all that stuff. And then so going through that, like now it's like I'm past that and I'm over it. You know, I went through that washing machine and I'm now in my own bubble. I do my own thing. This band is my sanctuary. I go there, I play music. You know, it just eases me. It like chills me out. I play golf with my buddies and that just puts me in a different world, you know. So, you know, I, I'm a happy person. Like I'm super happy, you know. I have the best girlfriend in the world. Like I'm stoked, you know, like and I think not tripping all that stuff like if i did i would get worked up because remember my straight edge days i would get worked up you know like i would want to fight people you know and now like i didn't i i, I get the sympathy I, I sympathize with those people and what happened to him like we don't know the whole story but to me it looks tragic and 
it breaks my heart, but at the same time, I, I'm not getting wrapped up in it either. You know, I, I sometimes try to self, don't watch the news. Like, I don't want to watch it. You know, like I want to do something else that, because my mind, my mind to me is very important and I want to keep it healthy and sane. And so I just live my own bubble. It may be totally selfish, but I think now that I'm 45, I have the right to do that, you know? So that's, that's me. I think it's kind of tough these days just because, I mean, there's so much going on. You don't know what, what to really believe and you don't really know you know what you're seeing if it's been skewed or what's going on so i think it would probably take up like all of a person's time to really try to figure out what's all going on a lot of it's obvious i mean yeah it's fucked up people kids shouldn't be getting shot you know obviously but i think everything gets spun this way and that way and the other way and it just it it turns into this huge chaos you know machine that seems to be for a reason to try to make us feel a certain way and to vote certain ways. And I think it's just pretty crazy. And it's, I don't know, it, it, it's kind of weird. But yeah, it sucks. People shouldn't be getting shot, you know? I mean, it's the it, it's a crazy time right now. What happened to those little beanbag guns, man? Like <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, right? But yeah, uh, it's it's too much for me. It, for us, it's always been the same. Like, we're we're old school, you know, like we didn't, when I started writing music, we didn't have pro tools, you know, we had to, I had to record everything on a four track, you know? And so I, that's how I know how to write. I don't, I, we have like a little, we have garage band at a practice spot. Well, we still play everything live though. Like I mic his drums, he plays his drums. I play my guitar over it just like we would in a real studio. So for us, nothing's changed. We just go and we just jam like on this new record. We just went and jammed like, and as a band, you know, we didn't even have, we didn't even say let's write a metal song or let's write this. We just we just jammed and recorded it and go back and listen to it and like what the hell were we doing or like that was pretty cool you know. So for us it's just all about it. we're a very organic band you know very sim- simple organic band and uh, we just do it old school and we're not technical players at all. We just we just do what we do. Really. OGs, OGs. How it comes out, it comes out. Uh, in the past, Will Avon Records, we would uh, write for that record with the record in mind. Um, but this one, we didn't even know we were going to do a Will Avon Record. We were just, we thought we were kind of just done. I thought Grady was over it. So me, Mitch, and our bass player Adrian just started jamming. And we were like, well, let's maybe start another project, you know? So we just started jamming. And it wasn't even raw. It wasn't even metal. It was just, uh, it was like more like, Pink Floyd, it was got funky at times. It was it was really just weird, you know, all over the place. And we recorded it all, and then uh, we thought, well, like, well, that's cool. Maybe we can turn this into a project or something. And then uh, when Grady came, uh, mentioned that or I talked to Grady about doing another Will Even record. He was into it, so I was like, well, I don't want to start all over again. So let's just use some of this jam session stuff and incorporate it into Will Even songs. So that whole time, those two years it took, we were basically meshing Woolhaven with this stuff that we had written and trying to put it all together as like a puzzle. Um, so this record was different than our past records, um, and I think it worked out awesome. So if we do another Will Haven record, I think that's going to be our formula. Let's go back, we'll just jam, try to write the most insane, crazy stuff we can, and then try to mold it into a, a record. We we did everything in our practice studio, all pre-production in our practice studio. I just recorded on a garage band. And then, so we had everything dialed, and then we went to Puss Cavern here in Sacramento with Joe Johnson. Uh, we wanted somebody that, we didn't want a producer, because we already had everything, already knew what we were going to do. Everything was done. We just need somebody to just press record and make it sound good. And Joe is the perfect guy for that. Joe is awesome. He's totally just chill. He lets you do whatever you want. He won't even... Super good at what he does. Yeah, he's awesome. Makes everything sound killer. And he doesn't say, well, you should try that. You should try that. He's just like, sounds good to me. You know, if you guys like it, I love it. So perfect guy for us. Um, Let us do our thing. And uh, it it came out exactly how I wanted it to come out. So yeah, props to Joe and Puss Cavern. Great studio. Great dude. We were at theme of the album. Maybe yeah. We had an art director that works for Minus Head uh, submit some a bunch of ideas to us. Um, some had like some skulls on it because he was trying. He had we told him what the record was going to be called, so he sent some skulls and some stuff. But he had one image of these hands. Um, it was like in a circle of hands, and we were like, oh, "That's kind of cool. Like we could probably do something with that." So then we narrowed it down to where just the two hands on the cover, and then. Uh, and then he kind of filled there in the blanks, and then we helped him create the symbol, the new William symbol with the circle and the thing around it. But um, yeah, it was pretty much his idea, and then we helped him shape it into what we kind of thought would look cool. And 
I mean, he knocked out of the park. It looks awesome. And that cover looks iconic, you know? It's right up there with, like, our old records with El Diablo and stuff. It's He nailed it. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, just like the, the, the front cover with the the very young-looking hand and then the old one, and it's just kind of, you know, life and death, the life cycle. It, it's pretty summed up right there in one simple image. It's like a yin-yang symbol, but with hands. Man, I love I love Brad from Minus Head. Uh, we it's funny how this record started because we were doing our little side project thing, and uh, Music for Nations, who was a record label in in England, uh, they were owned by was it uh, Zomba Music and EMI, and they were and Sony had bought them out, and so they were restarting Music for Nations because they had kind of folded. And Music for Nations was a pretty big label. They had Metallica on there and Tool and stuff, um, and Will Haven. And they they called me and said, "Hey, we're putting Music for Nations back together. Sony's gonna do it. What's Will Haven up to? Maybe we want to do another record with you guys." And I'm like, "We're not doing anything." And he said, "Well, if you guys are interested, we want to be the first ones to hear your new stuff because we were we would like to put it out." I'm like, "Oh, awesome!" And so we were stoked. So I class when I called Grady and said, "Hey, man, you know, Music for Nations is interested in doing another Will Haven record." And he's like, "Oh, that's cool. Just, let's do something." And that's how it started. And then Music for Nations never got off the ground. I guess Sony just said they weren't into it or whatever. Or just never kind of came to fruition so we had all these songs and like what are we gonna do with them and i've known brad a long time and brad approached us about doing the last ep um and it just didn't work out we went with artery um so i just called him up and said hey man we got all these songs i know you're like i I know what you've done with your record label it's awesome what you've done death valley high and insight and stuff and i was like i think you'd be perfect because we have a name we just need somebody to push it um and so he's like oh i'm I'm down to do it so um it's been awesome working with him he's so cool we like i talk to him on the phone all the time like it's kind of cool to like i've never had an owner of a record label like where I can call him on the phone and talk business you know it's always like this A&R person or whatever so with him it's he controls everything on his side and I control everything on my side and it's like it's a perfect marriage for both of us and it's worked out great and it's one of probably the most hyped records we've ever put out you know and he's a pretty small independent label but I mean the press has been awesome and um, it's I've seen her name everywhere and like he's done a great job with it so far so it's the perfect marriage I, I love Brad yeah, I mean, I think it's great that, you know, to, for him to be so accessible like he is, you know, to, to us, we can call him up. Also, um, a very forward-thinking record label, you know, like with all the Pledge Music stuff that they're doing and putting the packages together, with the ticket sales, and um, we did some, recently did some playthroughs that are going to be out um, of us playing, you know, just playing through one of the songs on the album. I think that's cool, and he's, you know, spawning all that, too, so it's he's doing a lot a lot more than most of the any, any of the other record labels have you know shown concern of anything to do with us you know before so uh, that's great i think it's awesome i think i saw him naked well i mean that was you know when we when we got signed we yeah. didn't see him naked but. well he said well, if we sign our contract he has to be naked while we sign it so it's a good looking dude oh, okay. that's he looks about. skinny on the outside he takes his clothes off he looks like dolph lundgren yeah yeah, we got some shows coming up. Uh, we're just kind of we booked these shows before the record came out, just because like we wanted to play. You know, we're getting tired of sitting at home because it's been two and a half years since we actually played live. So we booked. Uh, we're playing San Francisco on May third, uh, the Eagle May fourth. Uh, we're playing in Fullerton at Program Skate Shop in Fullerton, California. Then we're heading down to San Diego playing Brick by Brick, and then we're playing the Viper Room in Hollywood on May six. And then we come home and take the month off. Then we go up to uh, Seattle and Portland in late June, um, playing the Star Theater in Portland, and then Highline Bar in Seattle. And then that's all we have planned. And then we're talking about maybe going over to England and Europe in September, October. Um, but we're just playing it, playing it by ear, whatever, day by day. It's like, you know, with the record blows up, opportunities come. So we'll just ride that wave, but if yeah. but if it's just status quo, then we'll stay yeah, home and work. be at work, picking up dog poop and cooking cooking food. <laughs> I, it's funny because when we booked that show, we we're going through a promoter. Um, he usually books at the uh, where do we play bottom of the hill. Bottom of the hill. Um, and I just emailed him because we were starting a tour, but we were starting in L.A. And I was like, hey, we're coming through San Francisco first. Do you have any open dates? And he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll find something. And the Eagle is what he found. And I didn't know what it was. And then we looked at the website. I'm like, oh, okay, this is the perfect spot for us. So, yeah. Um, but, it, no, they have every Thursday night they have rock shows there. And it's it's a pretty cool club, like, on the rock show nights. It's, it's really, no, I haven't been there, but it, it looks really small and, like, pretty punk rock. So it should be a fun show, actually. 
heavy music. Oh man, like in the '90s, I was the biggest heavy music fan you could possibly imagine. Like Sepultura, Fudge Tunnel, Neurosis. Like, I mean, those bands are still going, but it was like a candy shop back then. You know, like you could go into a record store and find a million awesome heavy bands. And now, like, I search, and it's like, if I find something I like, I'm like, whoa, this is awesome, you know? It's like, it's so hard now to find, like, really good, passionate, heavy bands, you know, like we had back in the 90s. Yeah. Um, I like Code Orange just because they kind of brought back some of that old 90s style to it, which I like, the more riffs and more groove riffs. That's kind of what I grew up on. Um, So I was digging Code Orange. Um, but other than that, I'm not into the gent. I mean, uh, sugar, of course. I love sugar. You can't beat them. But the stuff that spawned from Meshuggah, I'm not a fan of at all. I can't get into it. I don't like it. So for me, it, the world's turned a little bit as far as heavy music. But the 90s, man, that was that was the world of me. Oh, yeah. I think we'd all agree on that. We all the same age. Yeah. <laughs>